One of the big philosophical differences between RPG enthusiasts and uh, uh, normal, well-adjusted people is that when it comes to defining different types or genres of RPG, normal people tend to think about them in terms of camera and aesthetic. And all top-down cameras are always called isometric. Fallout, Wasteland 2, The Age of Decadence, Underrail. From the point of view of a normal person, all of these are the same type of a game. But from the point of view of an RPG enthusiast, this is nuts, because these experiences are nothing alike. I have a lot of Fallout videos on this channel, and Fallout is a game where you go from place to place and solve ethical problems. But one of our most requested videos is Underrail, which is a game about exploration, combat, and meticulous build optimization. Welcome to episode 48, in which we'll be staring into the abyss of genre theory while playing the much-loved 2015 subterranean RPG Underrail. A game that is similar to Fallout in every way that doesn't matter, and different in all the ways that do. It's also ridiculously long, 100 plus hours even without the DLC. So the first thing you do after starting the game is quit to desktop, open your browser, go to Steam, and familiarize yourself with character building guides. The RPG system in many ways resembles Dungeons and Dragons 3 and above, meaning it's very feat-focused, and some of the important important build-defining feats might have specific and unintuitive prerequisites that need to be fulfilled during the character creation. Builds in this game are based on a weapon type. Figure out what you want to use and max out the relevant skill at every level up. Lockpicking is an optional skill in Underrail. Quest-critical items are accessible without it, but it's good to have lockpicking because Underrail is a game about exploration, and it might feel wrong having to leave some of the rooms unexplored because you couldn't get past the lock. It also synergizes well with stealth. Underrail has a fantastic stealth system, possibly best ever in any isometric RPG, but it requires specialization and is poorly compatible with a build that will wears heavy armor. Hacking is the same as lockpicking, but for electronic locks, and it's also optional. This skill is sometimes used in dialogue. The technology section governs crafting skills. In many role play games, crafting is an accessory. Here, it's a lifestyle. Crafting takes some intellectual labor to figure out, but it is rewarding. Psy is the underrail equivalent of magic. Thought control works great against enemies that have a biological brain which is most of them. Psychokinesis is about remotely punching people. Interesting synergies with melee builds. Metathermics is about manipulating temperature. Set people on fire or freeze them. Temporal manipulation has this game's versions of haste and slow spells. This school is very egalitarian. Non-specialists will benefit from investing points. My character uses willpower as a dump stat, but will still get temporal spells. Why not? In order to capture footage for the video, I initially started as a heavy-armored knight type of a character, but then after a few hours I re-rolled as this, a min-maxed knife user with stealth. I enjoyed it a lot more. So these are the basics of character building. Let's take a look at the content. Welcome to the South Gate Station, a major station of the Lower Underrail Network. Just like in the Metro series of games, stations are essentially towns. We are an immigrant. Very recently, we passed an exam and got the SGS citizenship. The game goes to great lengths to communicate that this community is a real place, full of real people with real needs. This is a residential area, offices and workplaces, a bar slash canteen, this is where they eat, and here is where they poo. There are pets, a classroom, hydroponics, with no psionic frogs this time, actually don't quote me on that, and a gym with a single bench. The doctor activates our psionic abilities by feeding us a literal red pill. The process is terrible for one's well-being. If you want a mana bar, you have to sacrifice 20% of your base health. The individual in charge of the armory provides us with a starting weapon of our choice. Merchant inventories are restocked every 90 minutes of in-game time, which can be sped up by pressing the plus key. 
Familiarizing yourself with the local merchants and their purchasing habits is an important part of the game. An interesting feature of the South Gate Station is its vertical nature. The place occupies nine floors, the upper entrance leading to the rail station, and the bottom one to the network of caves below the lower underrail. Tanner, an extraordinary tall man and one of the leaders of SGS, tasks us with restoring power to a nearby network of outposts. While most of humanity perished in the apocalypse a long time ago, the caverns of Underrail are not exactly spacious. So paradoxically, even though the population density is low, there are people to be found basically everywhere. Old man Jonas lives here in a shack right next to the station's entrance, sells hunting equipment. Rat hounds, the dog-sized rats, are the most common enemies encountered in this part of the world. I've been playing Underrail since the early days of Steam Greenlight, so for me, the screams of dying rat hounds are the sounds of home. The game came to us at an interesting time. Together with the Age of Decadence and Kenshi, Underrail was one of the icebreakers, the games to come out in the transitional period, after the decade of stagnation, but before the luxury RPG communism we're living through now. And one of the many things that make the icebreakers stand out is the tech they were built on. The Age of Decadence runs on Torque 3D, which looks awful. Kenshi is made using Augur, which is a little better. Underrail is built on a custom engine. The game has nice and very readable sprite graphics, but I can't help but notice that visually it doesn't look quite as good as Fallout 1, released in 1997. You know, a, a normal, well-adjusted person might look at these games and assume that they are a part of some kind of a grand old-timey RPG tradition. But an enthusiast knows that this is false. You won't find many games similar to Underrail. There is one game that is kind of like AOD, and there is certainly nothing else like Kanchi. These are original and innovative titles. The organs the creatures drop when killed can be processed into crafting regions that are used in drug manufacturing. The Subterranean Witcher Mindset and that's our first oddity. These blood-stained orders were issued by the Omega Central Command to their border guards. A 1,000-coin bounty is placed on one called Gorski. The oddity system is a clever alternative to the stale XP-based progression. If you choose to play with this system, which you should, you'll be gaining levels by accumulating cultural artifacts and curiosities that flesh out the background details of the world, but are not directly relevant to the story. The creatures sometimes drop oddities, so there is a reward for killing them. Now that we fixed the generator, all that is left to do is to flip the switches at the power stations. It's smooth sailing so far, until we discover that one of the stations is occupied by a crossbow-armed hermit and his two pet rat hounds. Yeah, you can use your persuasion skills. But then you'll miss out on the chew toy oddity. So, what do the people of Underrail eat, except for rat hounds? Well, they eat these things. And also fish. Install a fishing pole near a body of water. Left click on it to catch a fish once you see the animation. In gameplay terms, the creatures we fish out are processed into crafting regions and then used to produce health hypos, adrenaline shots, that sort of thing. Very useful for biologists. We are one. These are psionic beetles. The creatures have a hard shell that opens up when they use their psi attack. An old rusty periscope part, a proof that submarines once sailed, and perhaps still sail, the waters of Underrail. We get paid for the job well done. Money is very important in this game. You will always be buying stuff, ammunition, crafting components, blueprints, and the services of side trainers. This individual in the canteen teaches basic temporal manipulation skills. We'll try it out in battle very soon. The next task is to head out to the ruins of the abandoned Omega Station and assist the Gorski's expedition with whatever they're doing there. 
pain incoming. Yeah, I make my own grenades. Don't tell the cops. When the Omegas lost their war with the SGS, they sealed the facility, and it remained sealed until the recent earthquake. Our job is to find a keycard that unlocks the big door. The dungeon consists of three levels. All of them are short, and each one has a distinct theme or a gimmick. The first level is a tutorial on the use of an Omni tool. Its purpose is to unlock ventilation shafts. This is how we get to the otherwise unreal reachable places within the facility. The second level is about cameras and robots. If we are detected by cameras, they'll send patrolling bots to our location. The robots have two stun attacks, a flashbang and a short-range taser. Both are extremely dangerous. This is a single-character adventure, so getting crowd-controlled often necessitates reloading a save. The third level is about using ventilation shafts and computer hacking to resolve a hostage situation. Sneak into the security room and reprogram the turret to shoot bad people. You know what this made me realize? Underrail technically has real-time combat implemented. I believe the early versions of this game, back when it was still called Time Lapse Vertigo, had an option to enable real-time combat. That's no longer a thing. Anyway, so the hostages. Inject adrenaline, run towards the raider leader, and slice him to pieces. As a reward, we get a jackknife, a unique and incredibly useful item that provides a bonus to the lockpick skill, as long as it's in your hand. Signs of the burrower infestation. Whatever the treasure contained within, it's not worth it. I assume that sound in the background is made by the ventilation system. It seems to be unique to lower underrail. Other regions don't sound like that. The SGS authorities posted guards around the power stations we activated. A cool bit of reactivity. It doesn't seem we're making much progress clearing the tunnel without industrial equipment. Hadrian Tanner of the SGS Council says we should go to a place called Junkyard and get a replacement circuit for an Armadillo-class drill. One of the additions made by the developers post-release was the introduction of early game random mini-dungeons, more or less indistinguishable from normal areas. An underground cave full of hostile trappers. A small, three-floor robot base. The water treatment facility. Uh, this one is fairly involved. There is even a boss battle in the end. With rewards. Junkyard is reachable on foot, but getting there by boat is much faster. The SGS docks are on the same floor as the cave's exit. This will be the first cave settlement we'll explore in Underrail, a lawless place of scavengers and thieves built around a junkyard, hence the name. Quite a few well-stocked merchants in here. The problem is, they don't accept the SGS currency. We need to obtain Stygian coins. We have none. Junkyard is controlled by two rival gangs, the Scrappers and the Black Eels. You could and should work for both of them. And there is much to do. Collect debt. Assassinate someone in the casino. Rob his house. Don't get blown up. Retrieve lost cargo from a mysterious island. Skilled psionics can learn a spell from the pillars. Characters that are not skilled or lack willpower will get torn apart by psionic doppelgangers. It is useless to resist. Access to the other half of Junkyard is blocked by a tough gang of thugs that will act as an exam for our mechanical knowledge. Cooldown management, psionic abilities, incendiary grenades for crowd control. This is an outpost of the Underrail Protectorate, as well as an embassy of the United Stations. They claim these are different organizations, but are they really? The Protectorate are a high-tech army with a vague goal of preserving humanity, kind of like duty from Stalker. And the United Stations is the European Union of Underrail. SGS is not a member, but we do have business in the embassy. The administrator at Southgate asked us to deliver diplomatic correspondence 
weapons. You need to remove all weapons and grenades from active slots to gain entry to the offices. After we leave the embassy, a random stranger stops the player, telling us that there is someone in the bar who wants to speak to us. Abram has a bunch of questions, and he will generously pay for the answers. How many guards were there in the embassy offices? How many turrets? Were there any dogs? If we answer truthfully, he'll give us another job. Go back to the embassy, gain access to the ventilation system, plant a cybernetic spawn, a tiny augmented borrower. You release the little bugger, and it skitters away into the darkness. Abram is already aware that the task was completed. The next mission is even more complex. This fresh tunnel leads to the restricted parts of the protectorate facility. We are to infiltrate the place, avoid the guards if possible, and rescue a woman held in one of the cells. Many quests in this game have a theme of espionage, but not all of them. The final mission for the Black Eels is a multi-stage event that culminates in a massive battle where the Eels attack the Scrappers from several directions while the Protectorate Commandos back them up. We negotiated their presence. The game doesn't have simultaneous turns, so uh, big battles take way too long. One of the Protector's soldiers who got killed during the assault dropped an energy shield. Shields provide an HP buffer, but they need to be recharged with energy cells. Part of the deal was that the protectors get to post their men around the town. So the main event. The actual junkyard the place is named after. Back during the first months of the great RPG comeback, when Underrail was still in early access, this was the best classic roleplay dungeoneering experience on the market. All the dungeons prior to this were bite-sized. This is the real deal. It takes hours to complete and is designed to drain your resources and the will to live. This is, of course, a compliment. The enemies in the underground level are humanoid mutants and their dogs. The muties are armed with normal weapons, sledgehammers and guns. The combat tactics are the same you employ against normal bandits. Except this place is heavily mined and the mutants would often step on their own traps. They're dummies. Deeper in the dungeon, we'll meet the monstrous mutants. These don't use equipment. Instead, they vomit acid and are dangerous in melee range. And they will get to melee range, because their mutated dog companions have an attack that locks you in place. A commercial civilian wrist computer. The target audience for this product seems to be young men in jumpsuits. Huh. Few are gamer enough to understand this reference. We find the armadillo drill circuit we were sent here to recover. But a properly made dungeon needs to have a narrative payoff as well. This man, Wyatt, was in charge of the junkyard before this place got infested with mutants. Technically he still is. One day, two Biocore agents brought in a bunch of canisters that contained an unknown mutagen that reduced the locals into acid mutants. The mutagen also worked on Wyatt, but it affected him differently. The poisoning happened over a hundred years ago, and he hasn't aged or slept a day since. <laughs> We deliver the drill parts to Tanner and retire to our room. A cutscene. The invasion of the faceless. The nomadic people of the deeps. Some say there is a huge city in the middle of the deep caverns that can be reached if you follow the longest of their tunnels. They are called the Faceless because of the belief that under their masks they have no faces. That's what old Jonah says. The Faceless have been spotted in multiple locations in South Underrail. This is unusual. Gorski and Tanner want us to head to Rail Crossing, a town located between this place and Core City. The faceless event is when the game opens up. Well, it was always fairly open structured, but now even more so. Previously, some areas were blocked by non-removable rocks because of the earthquake. But now the merchants will start selling explosive charges that can clear these out. You can also manufacture your own. The SGS residents have new quests for us. The engineer wants to recover a battery from an old factory, which is a puzzle you solve by remote controlling a little robot in a labyrinth. 
Somebody else sends us to check on Camp Haythor, a remote village in the caves and a major producer of meat and leather in Underrail. There are a number of things to do in Camp Haythor, but the dominant plot element is the story of the Red Hound King, a nemesis of the villagers who lives somewhere deep in the western caverns. He really must hate the hunters if he bothered to set up and maintain all these overcomplicated traps. The Red Hound King is a giant man standing next to a huge throne, protected by his ancient Red Hound Praetorian Guard. There is a peaceful solution to this, and it's even possible to side with him, but this is too much work and I really want his armor. My recommendation for this fight is to try to take down the king as quickly as possible, since the animals, while dangerous, can't open doors to the throne room. Yes, the Red Hound Regalia. Nobody cared who I was until I put on the mask. The strength bonus it provides isn't very useful for a knife character, but the stealth enhancement is nice, I suppose. Random Red Hounds found in caves will no longer attack us, recognizing our authority. But the residents of Camp Haythor will shoot on sight, so make sure you undress before finalizing the quest. The Hunter feat is our reward for siding with the villagers. It makes us deal more damage to critters, which is a category that includes some very dangerous late-game foes. The consequences of the earthquake have been cleared, and the trains of Underrail once again run on time. Of course, taking a train is optional, the tickets cost money, and you can just walk the tracks, explore new areas, get into weird adventure. Like, what even is this? A bunch of lunatics are having a psi battle with each other surrounded by cats. A gang of hunters, led by Flynn the Flare, who is in possession of a unique pole arm. A bunch of red hounds next to a dead body with a book How to Tame a Red Hound by James S. Tupid. Are you IQ enough to get the joke? A traveling merchant random encounter. He has a great selection of items and a pig companion. So, Rail Crossing, one of the settlements attacked by the Faceless. It's a station-based community, but the layout is not as vertical as the SGS. There is basically just one level. The invaders have occupied the nearby train depot where Buzzer's shop is. It's possible to sneak around the Faceless, but I was curious how well my knife build would fare against them. Very good, as it turned out. The Faceless are searching for an artifact that was stolen from them. If you allow the mind reader to scan your brain, you can convince them to leave this place peacefully. For best results, you also need to have some points in persuasion. We don't have that. Once rescued, Buzzer the Hacker informs us that the object is in possession of someone called Cornell from the Acid Hunters gang from Core City. That's where the main quest takes us. But before we follow that lead, it's important to backtrack a bit and talk to the mayor of Rail Crossing and get the easily missable Lost Train mission. The Protectorate sent a train with supplies to Rail Crossing, but it never arrived because it was hijacked by these guys. It's a non-introduction to one of the game's more secretive factions, the Free Drones. If you choose to liberate the train, easier said than done, then much later you'll get an opportunity to join the Protectorate. But if you let the hijackers go, you'll get invited to the revolutionary secret base instead. All roads lead to Rome, and wherever you go, you'll eventually end up in Core City. Welcome to the mid-game. Try not to get killed. No, it's not your build that is bad, probably. It's just the difficulty spikes here quite a bit. This is temporary, as the Baldur's Gate of Underrail provides quite a few opportunities to gain XP. And you can also go back and finish exploring older areas that were previously too hard. Like the sealed borrower dungeon in the Omega Station. It was redesigned in one of the later patches to have a bug swarm gimmick. 
So, Core City. The layout is intentionally convoluted and irrational. In order to be understood, this place needs to be felt. To facilitate this, talk to the man in a robe and a wizard hat who sells recreational drugs. In the Core City vernacular, to get high is to get in motion. In some Slavic cultures, get in motion is an idiom that means to party or to socialize. The locals love to abuse the word hardcore. Everything here is hardcore. Gangs, equipment, hardcore city bar. Oh hey, our friend Abram is here. Another fun local word is to dominate. This means to be cool. He dominates means he fucks. The city has the same vertical structure as the SGS, except here it also reflects the social hierarchy, with the power havers, the three corporations of Core City, being at the top, along with the metro line. Oh, so that's why it's called Underrail, cause it's under a railroad. Ignore the weird colors, I am in motion. Actually, the upper railroad is simply called Upper Underrail, so I guess that theory was short-lived. Anyway, there is tons to do. Meet our old friends, the muties, living in a ghetto on the edge of the city. Be impressed by the core city trade fleet. Hijack a crawler vehicle for our friend Gorski. Rescue the crawler's captured faceless pilot. Joyride the crawler with your buddies into the lair of some gang that is bad. I can't say I was listening during the briefing. Norman the linguist invented the underrail Esperanto he calls Advantong, a language more logical and rational than common tongue. How do you say red hound in Advantong? Squick so much. Squick so much king. This dominates. Of course, there is a fight in arena. Start at the bottom of the hierarchy of challengers, prove your hardcore, climb the ladder. The first battle is the three of us losers against a large pack of squick so muches. They ignore our regalia, unfortunately. I intentionally tried to get my companions killed, cause you know, the trope in these post-apocalyptic games is that after we're done fighting the enemy, we'll have to kill each other. But no, that's not a thing here. Here. All the dropped loot is automatically gathered and stored in the locker in the arena building. Battle number two, psionic bugs. Oh yeah, that will stop us for sure. Battle number three, the frog monsters. Just lol. The next battle is against someone called the Pulverizer. He used to be a pretty good gladiator back in the day, but he started to badmouth Carnifex one of the greatest and most beloved gladiators of all time. So everyone hates the Pulverizer now. He was demoted to the rank of Challenger. If we dominate him, we might just put ourselves under the spotlight. Sprint, Stun Proc, Adrenaline, Taser, Extend, AP Drain Spell. Knife. Dominated. Underrail. Easy softcore game. Outside, an arena enthusiast strikes a conversation with us. His name is Gary, and he'll be the source of information on our opponents, their strengths and weaknesses. The thing about this game's version of post-apocalypse is that there were several sequential calamities. Elsewhere, we learned that the original big catastrophe that made the surface uninhabitable happened a little under four centuries ago. The underground civilization experienced multiple social and industrial collapses since then. The ruins beneath our feet are the proof of this. The political factions of Core City are fractured remnants of the old Biocore, and the guys in robes are the Chortists. They're described as an esoteric scientist religious community, presently occupied occupying the old Biocore University, accessible via the upper metro. We can attend a lecture on Chortism here in Core City. They insist that the being they study, Chort, is not a god. It's a creature that physically exists somewhere in Underrail, and it's a miracle of evolution. I choose to join the JKK Corporation. Not sure what it stands for, but it seems that they used to be the media wing of the former Biocore. I like the fantasy of being an agent of post-collapse Facebook. All three major political entities have mutually exclusive mini-quest arcs, emphasis on mini. Terminate a renegade employee. Diffuse a hostage situation by sneaking underneath the building where the hostages are kept and disabling the security system. 
our old friends the Gross Mutants are back, now with a rock-throwing version. I was delighted to discover the spider caves underneath the mutant grad. New enemies means new organs to process into chemicals, and new oddities to collect. The spiders use force lightning as their main attack. What if I try to tase one of them in order to get a turn advantage? I am so clever. Charged. Next attack will deal additional electrical damage. Interesting. Our job here is done. With the security system disabled, the JKK operatives should be able to deal with whatever the situation upstairs was. Frankly, I forgot. Might as well explore the sewers some more before heading back to the office. It appears we walked right into a trap set by a sociopath. But am I trapped here with you, or are you trapped here with me? Chop Chop the Robot and Zaman the Surgeon are boss tier characters, and it's best to kill them separately if possible. The reward is the Dehumanizer Knife, which I heard described as average, but it's sure as hell better than what we had. These are my toughest sons. Another JKK quest has us accidentally falling through the floor into an abandoned biocore lab beneath. An interesting mission that involves using a comlink to communicate with the agent on the floor above who can remotely unlock doors and assist us with advice. But I feel we've been neglecting our arena career. The next battle is against a crossbow user. Gary's information was correct. But it makes no difference, really. The humanizer dominates hardcore. In order to become a gladiator, we need to kill a gladiator, which we just did. The cheering crowd gets to pick our stage name. They're shouting, Sandman. I don't know. You see a guy in a squixamooch suit and your brain says, Sandman? Whatever. Actually, the way it works, the fans will give us a name depending on our arena habits. Sandman means we're famous for using paralyzing attacks. Next battle. A guy in a bomb suit. That's a new sprite. Dominated in one turn. A mutant gladiator with an acid pistol and two dog companions. I completely forgot about this fight, only to rediscover it in editing. He died so fast. Surgeon. Adrenaline, sprint, taser, knife, knife, knife. Good fucking riddance. The surgeon's license has been invalidated. A shielded gladiator with a pet robot. I might even have to use the slow spell for this one. Stygian Exorcist. A wizard. The shadow clones he summons are very annoying, and his mirror image spell is effective at soaking attacks, so he lasted two turns instead of one. Congratulations! The next battle is for the title of the champion. We'll either become the Invictus, or join the 156 gladiators slain by him. I wouldn't want to miss this match, even if it kills me, says Gary, the arena enthusiast. What did he mean by this? Oh my god, turns out he is Carnifex, the Invictus, coming out of retirement. This is the only hard arena battle. We should gain a few levels before taking him on. Or at the very least, learn the haste spell. Remember the free drones? Depending on the choices you made, that plotline continues either right here in Core City or in the Protector's base in Upper Underrail. If you sided with the drones, the first mission they give you is to assassinate an envoy of the Protectorate currently visiting Rail Crossing. The anarchist quest chain is short but memorable. There are a bunch of characters here with Polish-sounding names. I think the Northern Underrail is supposed to be like the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth of this universe. Remember the woman we rescued from the Protectorate prison back in Junkyard? She is here. I guess we were working for the drones all this time without realizing. Speaking of Junkyard, there is an anarchist cell there. I don't think the door is supposed to be open. Where is everyone? Uh-oh. It's probably possible to avoid the Protectorate strike team by using a cloaking device, but we shouldn't let them get away with this. We'll have to resort to using every trick in our arsenal. Stealth, bear traps, incendiary grenades, focus stim, morphine, adrenaline, knife. I love this build. I must say, it's really coming together nicely. R.I.P. the junkyard cell. 
once you get to level 16, you start accumulating specialization points. These are minor upgrades to the feats you took. It's possible to make some of the special attacks deal more damage or make the debuffs last longer. Hanging Rat is a bar in the upper caves. The inaccessible elevator descends to the deep caverns home of the faceless. The hunter in the bar sells lucky charms that possibly provide bonuses but only to those who believe they work. I get a cave hopper and a squeak so much. Another big attraction of the lower underrail is the foundry, an industrial heart of the underground civilization. The only place I've seen with multi-story residences, the McMansions of Underrail. Its citizens are materially wealthy, but they don't live for very long because of the pollution and the rock monsters that inhabit the mines. And Evelyn, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got in this situation. Yeah, this could have been bad but I got me some kick-ass karma. Evelyn kept the bodies of her victims in a vault underneath the house. This is like a capital V vault that she had all to herself, tastefully decorated too. I have a painting just like this in my room in SGS. A hair clip made from T-chrome and diamonds, value 10,000. She was bimbo maxing in a disproportionately large property while recreationally killing a man or two once in a while. Yeah, when a woman does that, she's a serial killer. But when a man does that, he is an RPG protagonist. Personal laptop. Games. Play Underrail Expedition. Oh. The natural predator of the residents of Foundry is the gang known as the Ironheads. They are somewhat Foundry-themed, packing a lot of heavy equipment. This guy is a knight, steel armor, Teutonic helmet, a claymore. Baylor is the leader of the Ironheads, a giant of a man armed with a unique two-handed hammer. Dominated and derailed, or like they say in Northern Underrail, Obosranta Obosan. The Foundry segment has a number of unique sprites, items, and mechanics not featured anywhere else in the game. This, combined with a slightly different mapping style, makes it feel like a location added in a DLC, which it was not. How do we deal with the seemingly immortal beast terrorizing the miners? We go back to the South Gate station and take advantage of the labs and the specialists there. Ezra examines the samples of the rock creatures from the foundry and devises the plan of dealing with the beast. By the way, remember the immortal mutant from Junkyard? By description, one of the BioCore agents that poisoned the place with the mutagen looked suspiciously like Ezra. Probably just a coincidence, though. This is Gloria. Gloria is a furnace. We get some friends for backup, place a psionic beacon in the furnace and prepare for a boss fight. We don't actually get to fight the beast itself. The battle is against waves of lesser rock monsters. The trick is to not accidentally hit one of your companions with area of effect weapons, cause that will aggro all the residents of the foundry. The cutscene where the protagonist pulls the lever to activate the furnace happens automatically. On the body of the creature, there is a single most valuable oddity in the game, the scale of the beast. Six experience points. Having killed an actual immortal being, I feel confident about taking on Carnifex. Focus Stim, Morphine Shot, Advanced Incendiary Grenade. Oh, that's a miss. Flashbang. Resisted. Cloaking Device. Retreat. Slow. Sprint. Cooldown Reduction. Incendiary Grenade. Success. Expose Weakness. Adrenaline. Knife. Turn. Knife. Turn. Haste. Knife. I am Invictus. Gary's equipment wasn't even that good. He was all about the skill. Becoming a champion is optional. But doing some arena content is a requirement to advance both the main quest and the local narratives. This is the gauntlet. 
another form of televised competition. Your equipment is confiscated. The organizers provide you with a jumpsuit and a locker full of generic weapons. The goal is to advance through a series of random challenges as fast as possible until you get to the very final room and pull the lever that kills both you and your competitors. It's cool, I guess, but I just don't feel like myself without the fursuit. Becoming an arena gladiator makes us noticed by one of the core city oligarchs. In our case, it's the guy who owns the Underrail Facebook. Turns out they are also looking for acid hunters, but for unrelated reasons. Acid hunters are the guys who are in possession of the mysterious object, the theft of which prompted the faceless invasion. Not the most elegant story structure, but whatever. Eventually, we we'll learn that the device is being kept in a secret lab below the city. I for one never trusted those derailed chortists. The first living thing to go through the device was a small white rat. I still have it, in fact. As you can see, the damage was not as great as they say. Academician Prokhor Zaharov, for I have tasted the fruit. The house we get as a reward for advancing the plot is the same no matter the faction you join. It's useful to have a centrally located place to store all your crafting crap. The game is nice enough to move all the stuff from your room at Southgate. I wish I knew this was a feature. I wouldn't have stored all the extra items in a junkyard dumpster. You'll need a small fortune to buy all the furniture to decorate this place. Time to explore the actual metro, the upper underrail. The closest we'll be getting to the surface. The Institute of Chort is one of the attractions. Tanner from the Southgate Council says that infiltrating the Institute is how we progress the main quest. The entrance exam is clearing out a group of raiders from a nearby mall and recovering an artifact they stole. Individually, the lunatics are no longer a threat, so the game places them in big groups with a bunch of commander-type named characters. Vanga is a reference to Baba Vanga, a Bulgarian mystic. In the 70s and 80s, she was known in Eastern Europe for her alleged abilities of precognition. The important final step before us being admitted to Chortism is an interrogation session with Preposter Emilia. There are no skill checks, but you need to pay attention because you cannot tell her the truth. Doing so results in the entire faction becoming hostile. The Chortists believe that by advancing their scientific capabilities, they can improve humanity so that we eventually could walk the surface world again. The tentacles are just aesthetic. The required reading for any Chortist is the original report that describes the first contact of Aiden, the founder of the organization, and Chort the mysterious being with extraordinary abilities the cultists study. Aiden himself is still alive, still the leader, can be seen idly next to a billiards table. Chort is evolution, warlock, semicolon. Finally we meet. I got a chance to deliver some pain to those derailed freaks and join the Institute of Chort. Pure win. There are obvious parallels between Chortists and the adversaries from Fallout 1, but unlike the children of the cathedral, these guys operate under a coherent theory. I am into Chortism, like, unironically. We are entering late game, but there is still about 25 hours of content ahead. Depends on how completionist you are. Even more, much more if you are doing the DLC content. Just to reiterate, we spent 50 hours playing Underrail to get to this point, and there is still a Fallout 2 worth of content ahead. Remember the spy quests we did in Junkyard? That quest chain is continued in Core City. It's a series of three tasks that need to be completed in a very specific adventure game way in order to trigger an important and easily missable plot revelation. This is Oculus, the all-seeing eye of Underrail, a machine from another world. You thought Underrail is Fallout, but it's actually Evangelion. 
Oculus was originally built by unknown beings called the Godman. Its purpose is surveillance. The crystal in the middle is a psionic computer of some sort. The Oculites, the current inhabitants of the machine, have a large database of the centuries of underrail history, its geopolitical situation, its past and current residents of note. Here is our old acquaintance Abram. I do not concern myself with Godman. I don't put much stock into these theories. They were ever just men, and they would not be the first to declare themselves divine. The crystal shows a glorified history of its creators, or perhaps a megalomaniacal fabrication. Both are quite common in human history, says Abram. YouTube might not communicate this well, depends on your device, I guess, but a fun peculiarity of Underrail is that the graphics become better the further you get into the game. The initial few areas can be described as high-effort programmer art, but Oculus, a location finished half a decade after the South Gate stage, is easily on the level of classic fallouts. Unfortunately, there seems to be only one quest you can do for the Oculites, and it's another boring detective job. Back to the Institute, then. In order to climb the shortest ranks, you need to impress the heads of either the Preservation Division, the Warriors, or the Investigation Division, the Scientists. It's possible to work for both. There are more than a dozen quests for us to do in this place. Some of the missions are very involved. Principal Investigator Rista from the Genetics Lab wants us to go to Forsaken Island and to find the so-called Behemoth, a large and potentially dangerous creature that is rumored to be able to breathe fire. The creature turns out to be a myth, kept up by the only residents of the island, the psionic witches Adria and Beatrice. Some of the tasks send us to explore the abandoned west wing of the Institute. This is when we first meet Six, a tall, humanoid, cyborg-like being with a hand that has six fingers. If you are concerned for the welfare of your kin, the best course of action is to stay out of the way of the faceless. We both should be leaving this place. Danger draws near. The technology in this room is similar to the one we've seen inside Oculus. This is interesting since the Institute building is the old BioCore University. That's not an extraterrestrial faction. The Earthquake is nature's way of telling the player that we need to advance the story. It's triggered by the faceless invasion of the Institute, and it'll always happen once you get promoted or turn the entire faction against you, making it basically impossible to get stuck. Aiden intends to flee to the deep caverns, the residence of Chort. The faceless attack. This is a time challenge. Survive enough turns for the elevator to arrive and then escape to the realm below. I just realized there is only one elevator in the Institute, so we just got everyone above killed. Oh, whatever, they would have died anyway. The Deep Caverns, the Underworld Jungle, the source of many legends and superstitions, home of the faceless. I've played Underrail a lot, but this is the first time I actually managed to reach this place. Our friend Six is here, or Ram Umbra, as he introduces himself. Six is possibly one of the godmen, who appear to be annoying science fiction people who experience time non-linearly and talk in gobbledygook. He makes it clear that in order to complete the game, we need to kill Chort. This sucks. I, for one, am a believer in Chortism. But I suppose this is not much of a plot twist, considering that the word Chort literally means devil in some Slavonic languages. Ahead of us is the old BioCore Hollow Earth Complex. The difficulty spikes here quite a bit. The first thing you should do is make contact with the Chortists, who have an outpost here in the Deep Caverns. You need to be wearing a uniform. You can pick one up in the previous area. The officer in charge is not pleased to learn of Aiden's death. He asks us not to share the news with the others. The morale is low as it is. They are barely holding against the faceless attacks. Hopefully someone Someone upstairs survived and they'll send help. Yeah, enjoy your copium.
While exploring the Hollow Earth, we are being watched by the Eye of Chort, which is a type of stackable debuff that reduces all our fighting skills and uh, spawns monsters pretty much in unlimited numbers. But there is a way of mitigating the effect. First, we take a unique bone knife off this body here. Then we go south and contact the Faceless. If we were diplomatic in our previous encounters, they'll let us pass. Eventually, we reach the Faceless HQ. The commander asks us to undergo mind reading, which we do. After that, they conclude that we are not really a friend or an enemy, so they won't shoot us, but they won't help us either. And that's fine. The Faceless won't help us, but there is someone who will. Leo the Hermit is the only human resident of the caves, not counting the Chortists. Over the years, he developed a, a know-how that helps him resist the devil's influence. Yelling at the hole and listening to the echo of your own voice grants a special feat that slows down the rate at which the unspeakable things penetrate your mind. More new threats. These snail monsters possess extraordinary high mechanical resistance, but are susceptible to fire. The inhabitants of the mushroom forest deal primarily biological damage. Make sure that you carry a gas mask at the very least, preferably a hazmat suit. There was an uh, uncomfortable situation when my gas mask ruptured during one of the harder battles. The Deep Caverns is the final area of the game, and in order to keep the difficulty challenging, the devs had to resort to below-the-belt kind of maneuvers, such as spawning unlimited monsters and setting up fights with large groups of enemies. Admittedly, this does work. I had to burn through much of the resources I brought with me. The ultimate goal is to open these huge gates leading to Chort. In order to do this, you'll need to collect a dozen or so items hidden all over the facility. Even with a guide, it took me longer to complete the deep caverns than the entirety of Core City content. Alright, time to end this. It is Shadow we expected. We have been starving ourselves for days in hope he would come for his prize. Such a heavenly feast it would be. The flesh of the High Ones, so opulent. Instead we got you, another Mangi Rail Rat. Come, join your river into our sea and become the flesh of a god. Some builds can simply DPS the eye without resorting to clever fuckery, but I'm afraid I might be a little underleveled for the fight. I have to confess I was getting a little bored of Underrail, but this battle brought the magic back. The boss arena has four mutagen tanks. Destroying each one progressively weakens the tentacles, extending their respawn times. After a dozen or so reloads, I discovered that the combination that works for me was stealth plus explosives. The sound of TNT detonation attracts the chortlings from all over the map, clearing the way to the next mutagen tank. And then we dominate the tentacles. Get in motion, go for the eyes! Whether it was a monster or a god, it's dead now. In the mound of dead flesh, we find the artifact which was the cause of the invasion of the tunnelers. The game never explains what the device does. Oh yeah, you guys. There is an option to keep the device to yourself, but it clearly means a great deal to the faceless. Whatever it is, whatever they are. The Chortist base is deserted. Might as well empty their armory. I don't know why I'm doing this, just a force of habit. Now that Chort's malicious presence has been removed, nothing is preventing us from soaking in the atmosphere, so to speak. Hollow Earth is the only place in this game where we find vehicles, ground vehicles, the ones that were used back on the surface. Our subjects still obey us. Even after finishing the game, I'm still finding new creatures and enemy types. Time to go home. Hey, Six. I'm looking for someone who pretends to be your kin, but isn't. 
Hadrian Tanner, he calls himself. Turns out Tanner, our old boss from the SGS, is also one of the godmen, like the Oculites call them. Tanner can change the way he looks. Six has been on his tail for a very long time. As we speak, he has already fled to North Underrail. We should follow him. Six will contact us in a place called Hexagon. Chort referred to these guys as High Ones. What does that mean? Six says it's an archaic term, a distant thought, but it speaks volumes about this particular manifestation. So the biomass creature is their ancient enemy from the stars, like the Zerg to their Protoss. Good thing I still have the keycard with me. The Oasis of Calm. Together with Ezra, we search Tanner's apartment. Secret room full of Godman technology. Mask fragments. Next time we meet, he can look like anyone. We need to figure out what to do next. The council people want to know about our adventures. Curiously, the game doesn't truncate this bit as much as you would expect. You actually have to click dialogue options and tell them things. Our old apartment. You can keep playing or trigger the ending, which can be done either by joining the SGS Council or by boarding the train to North Underrail. Hexagon, that's the place we need to go. I wonder if the sequel will allow importing characters from the first game. And then there are ending slides. Most of these are boring, but here are a few highlights. Junkyard was eventually annexed by the Protectorate, no surprise there. Gorski and his gang intend to take power in Core City, good for them. Everyone in the Institute was killed by the Faceless. Curiously, Aidan's body was never recovered. Following Chort's death, the commander of the Deep Caverns outpost led his people to the surface. The SGS joined the United Stations. And this was Underrail, a giant game made by a tiny group of people, one of the more convincing attempts of solving the problem of the dead bedroom that exists in the relationship of RPG and strategy. Tactical combat often featured in role-playing games is almost never good, but everyone sort of just pretends that it is. In Underrail, combat is definitely the highlight. All right, patron credits and final observations. This film is dedicated to the brave free drones of Lower Underrail. Jim Lawrence, Maciej V, Yuri Solodovnichenko, Dmitri, Ganzo Bomber Motherfucker, Miracle Moses Porter, Sidirom Fossil, Buck Swope, Snafu, Marching Iron, C6, Ilya Rubin, Source is the Best Engine Ever Made, Jackson Phillips, 1967 Ford Mustang, I Feed My Parrot Chicken, Danny Kilpatrick, Azazel and Baneful the Doggo, Frog, Eric Luitkehans, Dark Bot Pumpkin, Ray Nurse, Tony Spagani, Hank of the Hill, A Two Room Apartment in Bobruisk, Belarus, and Nathan Kabiska. You know, it's a curious thing. Most of the ruins we explore in this game are ruins of infrastructure built after the Great Apocalypse. Back in the Junkyard Dungeon, we found its only non-hostile resident, a man more than a hundred years old who never aged a day, living among the acid mutants. One of the individuals who released the mutagen looked like Ezra from Southgate. When we researched the foundry creatures with Southgaters, Ezra told us that he is familiar with its evolutionary ancestor. He meant these, the creatures from the mushroom forest in the deep caverns. The quest the Oculites give us concerns BioCore research into human life extension. BioCore was one of the old world corporations that descended underground after the Great Catastrophe, eventually becoming the government of this part of Underrail. But the BioCore that disintegrated into the rival Core City factions wasn't the same BioCore that created the Hollow Earth Complex 400 years ago. Ezra is of old BioCore. He probably saw this facility back when it was still brand new. You can learn his real name from one of the laptops in the residential area. 
What does it all mean? Nothing. It's just a cool backstory. It's satisfying for the brain to discover patterns in things. Oh, and here is another uh, oddity. So when I actually got to putting the video together, I found the old trailer for the game made by Felipe Pepe. And uh, something I've noticed from the old footage is that, well, I can't be 100% sure of this, but I think the dialogue writing was better in the early versions of the game. Isn't that strange? It seems that at some point during the game's development, the devs went back and rewrote the old dialogue to be worse? It might have been in the patch that introduced Camp Haythor. This is very much one of those games that use 20 words when you can make do with 5. So the next video is going to be a no-spoilers Jagged Alliance 3 review. And did you know that there was a new Fallout game in development? It's called Dayglow, and it's a DLC for Fallout Sonora. It should be out in a few weeks. There will be a full spoiler narrative video of this, because I know that very few people actually play these, even among the RPG enthusiast crowd. Feel free to post your character ideas. See you in August.